Good morning, everyone. My name is Jada Powell, and I'm here today with Jacob Bizinot. We're at the Cognite User Forum today, and we're going to talk a little bit about AI and some applications. But today we are on the Digital Doers podcast, and we're excited to talk about what's going on with the forum. So, Jacob, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You have been in tech for a long time, 20 plus years, and you recently founded the Iron Stag Advisory. So let's talk a little bit about your background. Well, I was in the industry for quite quite a while, as you mentioned there, 20 plus years. I started out as a uh, engineer coming out of the university and I was a petroleum engineer. So went into drilling and completions and stayed in that function for about 20 years, a little less than 20 years, and then moved into a leadership role where I focused on driving technology and innovation for Hess. Fantastic. So what are your initial thoughts so far of the Cognite User Forum? You know, this is the the second or third one that I've attended, and I've been part of the advisory board for about six years now. So I'm quite familiar with the company, with the history. And this year, what's strikingly obvious to me is, is the growing confidence within the company within the ecosystem of the users of, of Cognite and the acceleration of all parts. So the number of data tags that are being used, uh, AI is now more proliferating across the, the ecosystem for Cognite, the number of customers and the diversity of customers that are now using Cognite is amazing. So I suspect that the industry itself is also benefiting from a value perspective from that acceleration. So it's really exciting to see. And that's really what stands out to me uh, this year. Excellent. So can you talk about a little talk about a time in where AI has made a measurable difference in your operations? Any particular problems that you were trying to solve and what happened? You know, for us, uh, most recently, we deployed Atlas AI. And for for us, what we were able to really noticeably see is the ability to see data, to access information across our, our value chain. So everyone from the field side all the way to office engineering and support, the accessibility of data now is just tremendously better. Mm-hmm. That has allowed us to leverage Atlas AI to discover information, to be more proactive, and to address anomalies in a much more quicker way. So whereas before it took us, let's say, weeks to do root cause analysis, now we can do in just days, sometimes even a day. So it's really sped up our ability to get to the root cause of problems and then solve them. Yeah, that's huge. Speed to fixing the things that need to be fixed and then moving on. I love that. So what surprised you the most when you first started implementing AI? What what did you think? How did how did your employees feel about it? Was there hesitation or was it an easy transition? I think what surprised me the most is the distribution of reactions to AI. So you've got folks who are really into it, who very accepting. Um, And then you have other folks, other personas that are just not willing to give it a chance at the workplace. Most of us use AI in some form or fashion, of course. But I find that the people who are closer to safety critical decisions are Mm -hmm. much more skeptical and rightly so. Really? Yeah. Um, And they really have a tough time trusting or using AI as a as a tool to make decisions on. I think they feel better where they can use it uh, in the form of an, as, as an advisor to take the outputs into consideration, keeping a human in the loop, of course. Sure. Uh, but that has been my biggest surprise. And it's not um, always the same types of people, but you got them on both ends. Some people just really, really don't want to use it. And some <laughs> folks are just, just very accepting. Sure. And hopefully over time, if they see, you know, the value that it brings, that they'll eventually, you know, adopt it more Absolutely, easily. Yeah. And, and I think that's our that's our challenge, folks that are in technology is how do we how do we more effectively deal with the human centric side of change? How do we help folks get comfortable with 
things that they're uncomfortable with. So you have to address the human resistance and you have to build a coalition with people to make them feel comfortable, to give it a chance. And, right. then, and then it has to prove itself. Yeah, absolutely. I love how you said that. Got to set the framework for it. Yeah. So how has working with Cognite changed the day to day um, for your team? Now we talked a little bit about, you know, the folks that are, are really skeptical of it on the, the human side and the safety, but where's some, where's an example where you've seen it just take right off and didn't need much, you know, um, adoption from the team that like they were just ready to jump in and saw the benefit of it. That's a great question. I, I would say two things to that. So the first is, Generally speaking, I see a change in, in the broader asset management teams going from much more reactive to now much more proactive. Oh, wow. And I can recall 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the word reactive react was everywhere. Guys were just reactive about everything. We were reactive about problems. We were reactive about shutdowns. We were reactive about uh, missing our production targets, et cetera. But over the years, and I would say in the last three years, we've really gone from being more reactive to more proactive. And that's that, I think, has a lot to do with us building out our digital ecosystem, mm -hmm. which CDF and Cognite played a huge part in that, particularly at the industrial framework and, and data layer. Absolutely. So if you are personally talking to someone in oil and gas today that's really hesitant about AI, what is some advice that you would give them based on what you've seen? Well, I would say that you really need to focus on what are you trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Define the problem or define the opportunity. From there, you can strategize what type of AI is most effective to solving that problem. It could be a large language model, it could be generative AI, it could be other forms. But you need to define the problem, select the right type of artificial intelligence, and then be very conscious about how you're going to measure the impact and then, and then deploy it and measure it as you go. I would try to focus on using historical data. That mm -hmm. way you have a track record. It's sort of done offline. You can train the model offline. You could get comfortable with it. And it's not as big of an issue if it hallucinates or gets something wrong because it's historical and it's not really mm -hmm. used to make real-time, game-time decisions. I would also advise people to stay away from safety-critical components of the value chain. So try to work on or deploy it in areas that you're more comfortable from a risk perspective. Absolutely. What else do you see in the next year, the capabilities how how AI is going to affect the oil and gas business? What do you see coming down the pipeline? The pipeline. What I see building um, momentum is physics informed neural networks that seems to be gaining a lot of traction. A because it is it is important. It helps us to uh, speed up our simulation capabilities. But I also see from a change management perspective, people are more comfortable with trusting the outputs from physics-informed neural networks because they are bound by physics. They were trained by a physics-based model. Mm -hmm. And the oil and gas industry has tremendous amount of and a lot of history with uh, physics-based simulators. We simulate all parts of our, our value chain. So I think that's coming and it's going to help us speed up all of our simulation capabilities. And then eventually it'll lead to us trusting it enough to connect it to automation, which will then drive sort of system optimization uh, at, the, at the global system level. Awesome. So you're, you're speaking later on today. Can you give us a little preview of what you're going to be talking about? So what I'm going to talk about is uh, probably not that exciting, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to bring this technology back to our management system. At Hess, we deployed Lean. At other companies, they deploy Six Sigma, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that having this strong contextualized data foundation that we now have allows us to most effectively deploy a management system like Lean because at its core, Lean, Lean promotes the resource base or the employees to focus on the most critical work activities. 
And that's very difficult to do if you don't have trust in your data and your dashboards, which basically tell you what gaps you need to chase. So if there's not cultural trust in the data and the dashboards, then lean management systems and all management systems are very difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. So what I'll be talking about is the value that's created in supercharging a management system like lean, uh, coupled with CDF and the applications that sit on top of CDF. Well, that is exciting. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could really unlock some capabilities, right? Yeah. If you're taking, um, I want to talk a little bit about the data integrity too, because I know that a lot of people are hesitant to start with AI because they're not sure like how their data is. Yeah. What would you recommend to someone who's on the fence about it? I, I w what I've learned in the last 10 years or so is that any technology, any digital type of project that you endeavor to, to try out or to scale, you are going to find that the data that it draws from is not uh, what you think it is, or there's gaps in it, there's missing data, et cetera. That's a blessing and a curse, but mm -hmm. it's more of a blessing because it forces you to fix the data in order to make the technology deployment work. So trying to use different forms of technology, including AI, is going to expose weaknesses in your foundational data, which then will force you to fix it. We will not fix the data on our own. So right. these things give us the momentum and the and the and the fuel to fix the data as well so it's a it's a blessing and curse but more of a blessing no i agree with you there well jacob thank you so much for joining us today thanks excited to hear me. your talk this afternoon yeah, appreciate it have a great day thank you thanks for listening to oggn the world's largest and most listened to podcast network for the oil and energy industry if you like this show leave us a review and then go to oggn.com to learn about all our other shows and don't forget to sign up for our weekly newsletter this show has been a production of the Oil & Gas Global Network.